the moon. Um, first, one or two facts. It's um, an environment with extreme temperatures um, uh, from 260 degrees to minus 280 between daytime and nighttime. Um, it rotates in 27 days, which means um, the daytime is very long and the nighttime is very long, three, three and a half days each. Um, there are near the poles of the moon, the north and south poles, um, there are craters which um, never see the sun very far above their horizon, and the craters are deep enough so they're permanently dark and very cold. Um, there's water ice in these craters. Um, the moon is about one-third the diameter of the Earth, about 2,000 miles. Um, its mass is about 1% of mass of the Earth, and the gravity is six times weaker than the Earth, which means you can jump when we go to the moon, um, you know, at least 10 feet easily, um, for every two feet you could jump on the Earth. And it's um, a quarter of a million miles away, and it um, doesn't take very long to get there for a spacecraft, a um, couple of days. Um, and there is an um, interesting t time delay, light takes a couple of seconds, so when you, the astronauts spoke to us from the moon, there was a bit of a time delay. And that has interesting implications for when we want to do some serious exploration of the moon, which I'm going to tell you about. So here is um, a, a close-up of, um, uh, um, of, of the moon. The side that we see is on the left. Um, and this is the far side of the moon, because the moon is always facing the Earth as it goes around the Earth every 27 days. The far side we've only imaged with satellites. And um, it's interesting, um, these blacker regions are the, are the mare, um, possibly ancient seas, but lower regions. Um, and the far side is mostly high ground. Um, there's a mare over there, but, and you can see it's highly cratered. And the moon has no atmosphere, so all the meteorites um, bombard the moon continuously. Um, in the Earth, they sometimes, they mostly burn up in the atmosphere. And this means that the moon has accumulated all sorts of interesting debris from asteroids hitting it, which means that it's probably very rich in all sorts of rare elements. And so one of the reasons that um, uh, our space agencies want to go to the moon is to do actual mining on the moon. As we run out of things on the Earth, we may well find the sort of materials that we have in our smartphones, for example, the rare elements, um, one has abundance of them on the moon and other stuff too. I'll tell you a little about that later too. Okay, so how did the moon form? Let's, um, about four and a half billion years ago. Well, even before the, the, the as the sun formed, it was surrounded by um, a disk of debris. Um, we call this the protoplanetary disk, meaning the planets were formed out of condensations of this debris as it swirled around the young sun. And um, so what you see here is an artist's sketch, but over here is an actual view from the Hubble telescope of such a protoplanetary disk. Um, there's a star in the middle, um, there's dust which is um, absorbing some of the light, and, but the, this is the, the dark stuff is absorbing the light from the young star, and this is, um, this is an actual view of a planet's information around a, a nearby very young star. Uh, so this is how we, we learn about Although our sun formed 4.6 billion years ago, we know that from the ages of the um, meteorites, um, slightly b before the moon and the, uh, and the planets, um, by looking at the examples now uh, around us of similar stars to be in the future, we can learn about our formation history. It's a bit like doing archaeology in the sky. It's, it's very interesting, actually. And here's another example. Let me see that. Um, um, it's going slightly too quickly there. If this thing will control itself, sorry. Okay, so um, during this um, early phase of the disk with all this debris condensing into planets, um, this is another view, again, from the Hubble uh, space telescope of such a disk around a star, um, and even before the star had formed, actually, um, it was very luminous. 
um, because the star mostly is emitting in the infrared light. But you can see over here all this debris. And the debris basically is because it's of asteroids which hit each other and accumulate into planets, basically. And um, um, so, but planets in this phase are in danger of running into other similar mass objects which could have a very disruptive influence. And that is sort of how we think the moon was formed. So this shows you um, a sequence of events which led to um, the formation of the moon. Um, so there's, we give this hypoth hypoth hypothetical name, Thea, to this object which ran into the young Earth about just you know a million years, a few maybe 100 million years after the Earth formed. And it had an impact. And... Um, Lots of debris were produced, and the debris swirled around the young Earth, um, and um, eventually the Earth sort of um, was hot and reshaped itself, and the debris, much of it, condensed into another body near the Earth, the Moon. That's how we think the basic Moon was formed. Um, so this body, this hypothetical body, was maybe um, a tenth the mass of the Earth that hit it. Um, it's um, a rare impact. Not every of the all of the planets in our solar system have moons like this. It, it, um, we call this the impact theory of the, the origin of the moon. So let me say a little bit about um, how this, why we believe this theory. Um, for example, um, the Earth has a large core of iron. The inner part is molten still, actually, and that leads to volcanism, all sorts of things on the Earth's surface. But the moon does not have such a large iron core. We know that from studies of... Um, um, which have been performed by um, experiments on the moon, which I'm going to come to in a moment. Um, so we think that this impactor, this protoplanet, smaller than the Earth, which hit the Earth four hundred billion years ago, um, probably it had an iron core too. But when it hit the Earth, its iron melted and um, drained into the Earth. And so uh, the moon, which condensed out of the debris, then did not have much iron in, certainly not a core in the centre. And we, we actually can measure the density of the Earth, of course, on the average, we know that very well, and then see the Moon. And the Moon is lighter, than, less dense than the Earth, and that's because it has no iron core. So that, is, that gives us confidence that this theory makes some sense about a giant impact which would melt stuff. Another interesting um, aspect of all this is that um, the Moon and the Earth have similar um, ratios of different isotopes of oxygen. Oxygen comes in slightly different masses, and this tells us that um, the moon, just like the Earth does, actually, so the moon must have formed from material that was near the surface of the Earth, and that was all this debris that was shot out by this impact. So that's another argument for this impact, impact um, story. And then finally, um, most of the other planets around us don't have moons, similar moons. They have smaller satellites. The only one with a moon comparable to its own size is Pluto, actually. And this tells us that whatever formed the moon was a catastrophic sort of event which happened by chance. So these are the arguments scientists use to have some confidence that we understand how the moon formed. Okay, um, so again, an artist's vision of this giant impact um, leading to this debris and eventually making the moon. Okay, but what I would do now is show you some real pictures. So we should have sound, but we don't. But this is President Kennedy um, in 19... Could we run that again with higher sound? Uh, see if we can get you to hear this. Or let me turn up the sound on my computer, perhaps. Um. And no nation which expects to be the leader of other nations can expect to stay behind in this race for Spain. So, this, so the story begins in 1963, okay? So um, 1962, actually, September 62. So Kennedy, in a, in a, in a famous speech, um, said, we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they're easy, but because they're hard, because that goal was served to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we are willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. Okay, so that was his dream, and that was his great vision. He didn't live, of course, to see the end, but it didn't take very long, actually. Um, the US uh, astronauts were on the moon within a very short time, a few years after, after his speech. So he set into motion an immense effort 
incredibly expensive, one that we could never imagine today because it would eat up such a fraction of, a, of our budget. But then all things were possible. And it was possible partly because there was competition. So the reason Kennedy made this space was that the Sputnik had been launched before. The Russians had, were dominating the space, the space race. And uh, Kennedy was determined to make sure that the US basically overtook the Russians. Um, so this is a sketch of the space race. Um, and the, the, the red is the Russian activity, the USSR as it was then. And so you'll notice that um, they had launched their Sputnik and they got you know, men in space, animals initially, then men. Um, and the US came along later. Um, and um, its activity but stepped up and then um, overtook the Russians. Um, and then with um, basically um, the Apollo launches to the moon, which I'll show you in more detail in a second, um, they basically took over. The Russians never succeeded in getting any humans on the moon, no men on the moon. Um, um, they, they did manage to have robotic, you know, intercept, so on the moon and brought minerals back. They were one of the first to do that, moon rocks, but um, otherwise they have lagged behind the US ever since. Um, okay, um, so you can see um, it, this, this tells you the various historical events. Eventually what, there was a space treaty signed, for example, um, detailing um, some of the laws. I'll show you the examples of that in a second, that we should apply in outer space and um, to avoid having conflicts there. That was another very important issue. Um, so that seems to be more or less under control now. Okay, so the, um, this is the, the, shows you the sequence of launches that NASA developed um, culminating in the Saturn V. So the Saturn V um, is the tallest, heaviest, most powerful of all launches, and still is today, even though um, after the moon uh, exploration, there was never another Saturn V, and then even the blueprints of Saturn V were lost, and you know, 20, 30 years later, we're still trying to move up to the capacity of Saturn V. We'll be there soon with heavy loaders, but we haven't even got there yet. Um, but, so this is a picture of Saturn V um, uh, with the launch of Apollo 10, which was one of the missions that um, uh, didn't actually land on the moon, but launched a capsule that orbited the moon and showed that it was possible then to descend on the surface with a following flight um, within, a, within a, a few months after that. <clears throat> so what did the Russians do? Um, so they did one major thing with their lunar activity. They, they had, um, they called this the lunar program, a whole series of um, launches in the 1960s, 1970s. And they had one of the first sample return missions, so robotic mission, but they managed to send samples back to the of moon rocks. So that, that was a major accomplishment. Um, what else did they do? Well, um, they had a lunar orbiter um, in 1968. This is the Russian launcher, um, which is not quite as big as the Saturn V. It's, but let me tell you, the dimensions are 174 feet high, diameter 23 feet, mass 694 tons. They still have proton launchers that they used today, or were used very recently, to, to go to the space shuttle and take astronauts up there, US astronauts and Russian astronauts and others do. Um, and so in 1968, they, the, this is the, um, the closest they got to exploring the moon with, um, with um, anything resembling life. They had in this orbiter in 68, they had two tortoises, some worms, some flies, seeds, and bacteria. So that was what the Russians did. But they, were, uh, they never developed the ability to um, take men to the moon. So that came um, with um, the US. Saturn V, um, look at the immense height of this, 330 feet, 33 feet diameter, 3,000 tons. And so this was used, it was a three-stage rocket. Um, when it got to the moon, um, it, there was a capsule that orbited the moon, and there was another capsule that descended onto the moon's surface. Um, carrying two astronauts, one was left behind in, in, in orbit or on the moon. And um, the US did um, manned lunar landing, several of them between 1969 and 1972. Um, so that's uh, um, 
Here is um, the Apollo 10 lunar module. This was the rehearsal, the dress rehearsal for the first walk on the moon. So just before, they, the, 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 this was the, on the top of the Saturn V rocket. This got to the moon when it was in orbit around the moon. And then um, this was dropped, um, this would be dropped onto the moon surface with two astronauts inside to do the first moonwalks, etc. So and that came about um, within a few months later um, um, with um, Apollo um, 12, actually. So there was a whole series of these Apollo um, events. Um, this one, which is the last one actually, um, carrying um, a moon a capsule, lunar capsule, and astronauts who walked on the moon. Um, so this, this um, took this iconic photo of Earthrise um, on the moon, which many of you have, uh, have seen. Um, and that was in 1969. And since then, um, we haven't been back to the moon with men, actually, with or, or women. Um, so, um, but that will come in the future, no doubt. So this, incidentally, um, when the um, capsule returned to the Earth, um, it achieved the world record speed for anything um, involving humans, 24,700 miles an hour on its way back to the Earth before landing in the ocean, where it's then retrieved, the two asteroids are retrieved. Okay, so, um, so the Apollo sequence um, from Apollo 12, leading to the first walk on the moon, to Apollo 17, the last uh, mission to the moon, um, these are the sites they landed on, spat around the moon. They chose different sites to explore the terrain in different places on the moon. Um, some in the highlands, others near the lowlands. Um, but basically choosing landing sites that were, you know, thought to be fairly safe, for, um, you know, getting back from the surface of the moon. Um, so this is um, Apollo 12, Buzz Aldrin, one of the first to walk on the moon after Neil Armstrong planting the flag. This flag is still there, except that we're pretty sure it's totally blanched white by now because of, um, you know, solar radiation, etc. But, um, um, and um, the first scientist on the moon was Harrison Schmidt in Apollo 17, the, the last of the, uh, of the flights that landed. He's a, he was a geologist inspecting a rock there. Okay, you can see him over there. Okay, so that was in 19... Um, uh, 72, basically. Okay, so um, let me now... So everything finished for flights to the moon, uh, manned flights to the moon, and since then there have been automated flights, uh, robotic flights, um, but there was a, a gap also, a long gap actually, so if suddenly fast forward from 1972 to 2009, um, where this was one of the most interesting... Um, uh, satellite sent to orbit the moon. Um, it was, and it basically has a has a precision camera on board, which imaged the moon, the far side of the moon, the near side, all sorts of geological features. Um, so I want to show you some of the amazing photos that um, of the lunar terrain that we have been studying um, in the past um, ten years, basically. So this is um, a crater. Um, again, discovered originally by one of the lunar probes, since the Russian name, um, and you can see the incredibly interesting terrain. Um, um, so this photo was just produced a year or two ago, right? And so these are, you know, kilometers across, basically, tens of kilometers across. Um, very interesting terrain to imagine hiking on in the future, right? Um, so this is a view of the North Pole of the Moon, um, and so this is full of uh, craters, many of which are perpetually, the insides are perpetually dark, actually. And I'll show you how, and very cold also, I'll show you examples of that in a moment. Um, and um, here's a view of the south pole of the moon. And the south pole is very interesting because that has some of the craters with the highest rims. And um, because the sun is always low on the horizon when you view, when you're on the moon at either the South Pole or the North Pole, that means it never gets too hot or too cold. You don't have the extremes of temperature. So it's the ideal place for developing future human activity if we want to establish a base on the moon when we go to one of the poles. Um, and um, and um, what is uh, quite amazing also is that despite the lunar day lasting nearly 14 Earth days and the lunar night lasting 14, that means that if you rely on solar power, you have a hard time during lunar night. But the, the, the rim craters near the South Pole 
are so high, they're four kilometers high in the case of this one of these particular craters over there, I'll show you a close-up in a second, the, the, the tops of the craters always get sunlight. So you can imagine they'd be ideal for producing solar power for future activity on the moon. Um, and um, when we eventually get to discussing who owns what on the moon, they'll be highly competed for, I imagine, in the future. I'll discuss that in a moment too. So this is um, a map, a topographic map, a topographic map of the moon, showing you um, the, the elevation sort of different places on the moon. So sort of this is 10,000 meters. That's... Um, in a Mount Everest-like, okay, and um, or more actually, and you can see that. Um, and so um, uh, and there's a lot of variation: um, um, minus nine thousand meters, plus ten thousand meters, um, uh, of incredibly varied topography on the moon, moon lunar surface to explore. <coughs> so this is um, a close-up of. Um, one uh, crater that would be, a, again, a very interesting place to explore. Maybe if you want to actually build a base on the moon, you would start off with a crater like this. It's, again, near the South Pole um, and um, doesn't suffer from extremes of temperature and has a flat surface where one could do construction on and probably lots of ice as well. Um, and I'll show you the evidence for ice too in a second. Um, Okay, so, um, so this is a, a close-up of some of these very dark and cold craters. And um, so just to re remind you, if you're, this is the Earth actually, but if, if you're near one of the poles, then basically you never see the sun very high above the horizon, okay, from um, in the, either the Arctic Circle or the Antarctic Circle. Um, and um, so ideal places to go would be in these perpetually dark craters, um, so this is the Shoemaker Crater is one of them. Um, and with these very high rims in sunlight all the time, and there are a number of others. So um, there's plenty of space on the moon for everybody really um, to develop um, future activities on the moon. I'll explain what those activities are in a second, but um, the space agencies are now beginning to plan um, what they should be doing on the moon in the next decade or two decades or three decades. This is long-term long -term activity in, on the moon because we haven't yet got ro rockets of enough power to even get men back to the moon. That will happen in the next 10 years. In fact, China's already announced that it wants to put the first woman on the moon. And I will show you that China is far ahead at the moment of the US in developing probes that go to the moon. I'll show you examples there in a second. So there, there, there is, there's a new space race beginning, basically, between um, the various countries that want to explore the moon. Um, so this is um, one of these, the Shackleton Crater. Um, imagine these rims four kilometers high, 20 kilometers wide, eternal darkness in the center, perpetual light, at least for 90% of the time on the, on the rims, giving you all the solar power you might need to do whatever you want to do in the, um, in the dark crater. That'd be a great place to have a telescope, for example, because it's always dark. Um, and there's no atmosphere on the moon to fuzz your images, so that, that's also good. The only worry is there might be a bit of lunar dust, especially if there's a uh, uh, manned activity not far away, but you know there is no there are no winds on the moon, so the dust you know um, rises and eventually settles down. So um, although that can take some time, but it it probably is not a great source of worry. We think. Um, okay, so there is water on the moon. So this is a truly international business. So, so the Indian Space Agency also is very interested in the moon. So they they um, have a series of launches to the moon. This is the first one um, a few years ago where they had an infrared um, spectrometer which could measure evidence of uh, water or compounds that contain water. And so they found in, um, in these dark craters evidence that of water ice, basically. And so um, we're pretty sure that you have an abundant supply of ice on the moon. Ice is great because um, you can break it down to make oxygen. You can use oxygen as a propellant for um, rockets to go further afield. So basically you can treat um, places with water as, you know, as, a, as a reservoir of fuel for future exploration of the planetary system. That's why we're very interested in going to the moon because the gravity being lower on the moon, one could then launch things from there with a good supply of fuel to go on to explore, you know, with heavier payloads throughout the solar system and beyond even, eventually. Okay, so that's the water. Um, 
let's look at the temperature. So this NASA um, experiment I mentioned, the one that did the photography too, also had a, um, an infrared device on board that measured the temperature. And this is to show you the incredibly low temperature. So this is, this is in degrees Kelvin. So this is minus you know, 250 below centigrade. That's the purple color. So the region's as cold as that. A lot of it is blue. That's minus 100 Kelvin. Um, and um, this all... Uh, um, 100 degrees above zero, absolute zero. And so these are just amazing, amazing places where, um, because it's so cold, they're also great places to do infrared astronomy, which needs a cold, a cold environment. So astronomers are excited by this too, but they're also, as I said, reservoirs of ice as well. Um, and again, um, there are regions on these high rims around the craters near the poles that always see the sun because the sun um, um, is low in the horizon, but even you know, uh, at night, um, the craters are high enough so you can see, still see the sun even though it's below the horizon. And, and um, so this, uh, the lighter colors show you regions of perpetual light. And this is um, uh, an image of um, the, the crater rim around the Shackleton crater. Um, again, um, if one ever were, 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 were you know, selling real estate on the moon, um, these regions near regions of petrol light would be the, uh, the most valued resources on the moon. And I'll come to the, the legal implications of this in a moment. Okay, so um, the European Space Agency has plans. Um, we are still members, I believe. We will be members even after you know, Brexit. So that, there's no plan to leave. And so the, um, they are planning. Now, it's going to be incredibly expensive. It's not clear that Europe can afford this, but they're certainly building up plans. And so they, will, they want to basically construct huge domes on them. And why a dome? Because you need to protect yourself from the radiation, basically the cosmic radiation, which is pretty penetrating. So basically you, you, you put your... Um, uh, people or life qu living quarters inside a dome, which obviously has oxygen, etc. So you can control the environment better that way. And there are sort of a series of domes. Um, um, and the idea would be to um, do tourism, basically build hotels on the moon. Um, because this would be a way, again, of um, raising, uh, having a commercial aspect to this. And um, because the whole project is so expensive, you may, you may well need that to, um, to explore the moon. And then um, there's another activity, which is very important, which is mining. Okay, again, you, you don't want to repeat some of the disasters we've done on the Earth, so hopefully, like open cast mining on the moon, so hopefully we'll avoid things like that and have something under more control. But the moon, nevertheless, is, is a very interesting resource for rare elements. And maybe the rarest element of all, um, which doesn't occur naturally on the Earth at all, is an isotope of helium called helium of mass 3, which is the ultimate f resource for fuel for thermonuclear reactors. Now, we, at the moment, we don't have... A, the only thermonuclear reactor we have, where there are two, one is the sun, which is great, and the other one are hydrogen bombs, which are not so great. But those are, you know, burn... Uh, energy by bringing hydrogen together to make helium, basically, and the mass difference gives you poor energy. Um, so, but it turns out they... they when we try to make these, we're, people are experimenting on developing this for future energy re release because you can basically use water or seawater as your ultimate fuel. And um, so that's unlimited. You get unlimited energy from this in the, in, in the future. So it's thought to be the ideal. And it's also much cleaner because you don't use uranium. You don't have heavy radioactive isotopes. And it turns out that using helium-3 is the ultimate uh, fuel for nu nuclear um, uh, fusion reactors because that's the cleanest one uh, speaking, radioactively speaking. And so that, that is a great resource for the future. It occurs naturally on the moon because the moon has been bombarded for billions of years by impacts of asteroids and, uh, and cosmic rays, etc. And those impacts produce helium-3. So we make it on the Earth artificially in the lab by having uh, bombardments like this, but on the moon it's natural. And all you need is to collect a few kilograms of it and you have enough you know, fuel supply for a very, very long time for, a, for the whole planet, basically. And so that is one of the you know, dreams of the future, I would say. But now we're talking, you know, fast forward 100 years or so, perhaps, to, to make that real. But eventually we will need to get helium-3. Okay. Um, 
So um, let's move on. Um, Okay, so astronomers are excited by the moon. Okay, here's why. You can imagine um, there's no atmosphere on the moon. Um, so the atmosphere on the Earth is what makes it, you know, it, stars twinkle, right? You've seen that. Um, and um, it, it means that you can't really get a sharp image of a star. It's impossible. You can see the planets okay because they're large enough not to be uh, affected by the the blurring of the Earth's atmosphere, the, the, the turbulence of the atmosphere, because the, the, the light rays get slightly, you know, refracted. But stars are a problem, and so we go to space. You have the Hubble Space Telescope, which does beautifully in space, but on the Moon, but that's, you know, just two meters across. It's a small telescope. On the Moon, you could build a much, much larger telescope, and the bigger the telescope, the better your precision at imaging something. And so you could actually, if you could build a big enough telescope, you could actually image planets um, out to hundreds of light years away. We call them exoplanets. Um, they're twins of the Earth. So far, we've only really explored our own solar system in terms of detailed imaging. We're beginning to, to find evidence for many planets, thousands of planets around nearby stars, but we don't have a single picture of anyone because they're just too small. Um, you, you need to do far better than we can do with a two-meter telescope. So here's, a, a, again, a, a futuristic scheme for a huge telescope. The idea is you take one of these um, big dark craters, which is dark so you can look at the stars all the time, you suspend, um, you put all sorts of mirrors are, are in, are in the bottom of it, and you suspend a, a wire across, um, which is going to act as the focus of the telescope on, in the middle of this wire. So, this is a, so you'll now have a, a telescope that's essentially kilometers in diameter, in principle. Okay? So a design that we know, we already have one on the Earth, um, a place called Arecibo in Puerto Rico is a giant radio telescope exactly like this. But we can in principle do this too for the infrared if there's no atmosphere to mess things up. And the idea is then um, you would look at the sky and here's what you might expect to do. You could actually image um, the nearest um, nearby solar system. So this is one called TRAPPIST. One, it's it's an interesting exoplanetary system. We know it's got several planets around it, one or two of which are probably twins of the Earth in the sense they're roughly the same distance from, from their parent sun and they probably have atmospheres, etc. We don't know for sure. But you could actually begin to image these things directly with such a big telescope. And that would be amazing because, um, you know, if, if you look at 100 exoplanets, the chances are if there is other life in the universe, a few of those might show evidence for, for something interesting. Um, of course, we have no guarantee that's true or not. There could be, life could be such an exceptional thing that we might have to look at millions of planets to find evidence of anything, or may, may, maybe we'd never find anything else. But it's possible, and that's one of the major goals of future exploration, to eventually image, be able to image planets. But you need to do, you know, basically thousands of times better than you could do for imaging anything from with a two-meter telescope. You need a kilometer-sized telescope to do this, just from sheer numbers, and the moon might be the only place you could actually achieve this, apart from issues like worrying about the dust. Okay, so here's another um, wonderful thing that the moon can do for you. So the Earth um, is a great place to do radio astronomy. And why radio astronomy? Because radio astronomy is a way of looking at radio waves from the distant universe and looking back far before the first stars formed. So we can't quite see all the way back to the Big Bang, but we can certainly see what we call the Dark Ages, when there were no stars at all. That really is digging into our past. And in the Dark Ages, there were the seeds, the density, clouds, or whatever, from which all galaxies formed. So radio astronomy, in principle, is a wonderful way to do um, archaeology in space, basically, to look for a very, the ultimate beginnings of, um, of all galaxies, all, all luminous structure. Anything you see uh, you know, in, in the sky, shining light, before then there were gas clouds, which were dark in principle. But those gas clouds are made of hydrogen, the most abundant element in the universe. And the hydrogen, um, it glows very, very weakly, um, but... That's very hard to see, it's glow, but what you can hope to do, because it's so cold, is detect it in absorption against the fossil radiation from the Big Bang. And so you can actually hope to search this for these radio waves, for these seeds of fluctuations. Amazing thing to discover, it's one of the biggest races now in astronomy to probe the dark ages. You know, we've, we've done a lot with the light in the universe, we want to go back further and further towards the Big Bang, this is our best bet to do that. Um, but, you know, the, the problem is that because we're looking so far away, normally we map out hydrogen in the Milky Way, 
by working at a, a, at a wavelength of radio waves of 21 centimeters or a frequency of about 1400 megahertz. The trouble is when you look far away, everything gets red shifted. So you're looking at the same waves, but now at a much, much lower frequency or a much longer wavelength. So you're looking at a wavelength of 30 megahertz to see basically this cool stuff from the dark ages. Um, now, unfortunately, on the Earth, we have something called the ionosphere, right? You, you've all uh, maybe come across, um, you know, the, um, the, 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 when you have interference in radio communications, right? The, or even, you know, in telephone communications, you get a lot of static. And you have incredible static if you want to go to this lower frequency on the Earth because of the ionosphere, um, which is produced, you know, at the top of the atmosphere by interaction of ultraviolet light and cosmic rays with the Earth. And so that gives you all this static. And so you can't see the dark ages. It's very, very hard to see it from the Earth. We're trying, but maybe for the future, but it's a hard thing to get around. But the, the far side of the moon is the greatest place to do this because that, we say, in terms of radio noise, all this static, is the quietest place in the entire inner solar system. Why? Because first, there's no ionosphere. There's no atmosphere on the moon. There's no ionosphere on the moon. And secondly, the far side is shielded from the Earth. The problem with the Earth is not only has it got the ionosphere, but it's also a huge source of radio static. Your mobile phones, right? Radar, maritime radar, all sorts of things. They, they come in at these low frequencies that you would like to look at the dark ages. Now, astronomers have reserved certain frequency bands where they, you know, they, the, the, where they, you know for their use, for science use, so we, there's no direct competition at the moment with mobile telephones, etc. But uh, because you're looking for such an incredibly weak signal, that's not good enough because there's spillover in adjacent radio bands, all this stuff. So you have to go to the moon. So here's a concept study um, for going to the moon and doing this. Um, this is the sort of what we're doing. So you take um, a gigantic sheet of mylar, kilometers across. Now this is easy enough to make, and mylar is a very, very light material. So you can, um, we've actually, we use these for concept studies called solar sails, which are basically um, light from the sun can, you, you can push the sail and it can gradually speed up and get to huge velocities. It's a concept for, for space exploration, actually. Anyway, here's another use of a solar cell. You have this kilometer um, size mylar sheet and you print on it with a special 3D, 3D printers um, very thin conducting um, wires, basically. It's just like a, a TV antenna, basically, but you print, imprint them on the mylar sheet. There's almost no weight attached to this, so you can have this huge sheet of mylar, a roll of mylar, and then you send a, a, a lunar rover loaded up with this. You fire that off to the moon. Or you can even do the, probably do the construction and printing on the moon itself eventually, but you, you send this to the moon. Um, and then it, it rolls out this mylar sheet, with all, and the, these yellow crosses represent these printed dipoles. Um, and the rocks don't matter. You can say, oh, there are rocks in the way, but you know, you're looking at a wavelength of 10 meters, right? Really long wavelength. So if a rock's a meter across or whatever, it makes no difference, right? It doesn't, so these sheets can be on the rocks or anything on the moon's surface, that, which is, a, you know, and then you can listen into the universe. So it's an incredible uh, concept. Um, we want to do this on the far side of the moon. So that's the sort of experiment you want to do if you want to, as well as you're building your hotels, doing your mining, the scientists want to get in there too and give you some sort of higher goal, you know, um, inspiration to do something, you know, beyond that, to look at the beginning of the universe. So we're hoping that um, that will be something. Um, anyway, so you're looking for absorption against the, this, this fossil radiation, we call it the microwave background, and you can look at this... Um, uh, wavelengths of 10 centimeters because this enormous red, everything was red shifted, it was expanded, everything got stretched out by a factor of 50. So we're looking, you know, a few million years after the Big Bang, basically, in the Dark Ages. And, and you need to spread these mylar sheets out over hundreds of kilometers to again to get the, the resolution you need to study these clouds. And you need millions of these, of these antennae. So that sounds like a, a tall order, um, but in Western Australia, in the most radio quiet environment we have on Earth, which is not good enough to do this dark age, but it, you know, it's an approximation. They're doing other stuff there, actually. So in uh, a few years' time, we're building a telescope called the Square Kilometre Array, literally a kilometre across, and there'll be something like 100,000 of these dipoles. So these are simple wires, these are a slightly vertical arrangement, but it's basically the same thing. And so imagine we're planning these sort of thing on, on the Earth, 
Um, it's expensive and we'll be studying um, the universe far away, not as well as we'd like to get to the dark ages, but to do other stuff at these very, very low frequencies. Um, probably not to 30 megahertz. We don't think we'll get that far, but a little bit higher maybe. And so that's, that's being planned for the Earth. So if we can do this on the Earth, it's simple technology. We understand how it all works. Then developing this on the Moon should be possible. We'll need probably um, all sorts of um, the plans are not so much for humans to do most of this work, but for robots to do it. It'll be robotically deployed with humans guiding this. You have to have humans there not too far away because if you can't do it entirely by robots because there's a time delay of a couple of seconds in sending signals from the moon back to the Earth. So if, if a robot, you know, deployer runs into something, it could self-destruct in a fraction of a second. So you better have human people not too far away. So it's, it's an interesting concept to have joint human robotic activity in, this will be in 20 or 30 years time, on the moon. So that's the sort of thing we imagine doing. And that'll be needed for construction. Whatever we do on the moon, it'll be a combination of the two. Okay, so when do we go back to the moon? Okay, so... Um, this shows you um, a telescope launched by, the, by China, um, Chang 3, Chang'e 3. It was launched in 2013. It took data look, looking at stars for a couple of years. A 50 centimeter telescope, very small, that was landed there on, on, on the moon. Um, the current US presence on the moon is this, this uh, Neil Armstrong's footprint. Um, now, you may wonder, um, the scientists say, you know, no one's going to give or give us, it's got billions and billions, whatever, to build telescopes on the moon, etc. Um, well, you know, China didn't seem to care too much. They have launched it, they launched a small telescope already, but we want bigger ones too. And what you have to remember is that the space telescopes that we have, like the Hubble telescope, cost, I think, the latest estimate is $8 billion, right, total, okay. That's a huge amount of money, um, but it's a tiny fraction of what the US, or, you know, the world spent on the International Space Station and on the launches to get us there on the space shuttle. So as long as you can restrict yourself to 5%, say, of developing all these activity on the moon, then science is just piggybacks along. And so that's the hope that we'll um, get um, um, all this interest um, in the moon to do tourism, mining, um, fuel for future. Um, uh, it'll be, a, you know, a, a giant... Uh, gasoline station, basically, that's one of the thoughts for doing interstellar travel, um, because we're, that's all going to happen eventually. So, you know, doing a bit of science at the same time to look at the beginning of the universe should be a tiny perturbation, which, ought, which we think will excite the space agencies and maybe even motivate them to, to do more. Okay. Okay, so is this happening? So um, here are some of the interesting stories going around now. So the head of the European Space Agency has announced that he wants to start building a moon village. And he says there'll be a permanent lunar base by the end of the next decade. I think he's being a bit optimistic, but that, and I showed you some of the pictures of these lunar domes that, that will be developed. Okay, so um, what else? Um, so um, uh, Trump wants to send astronauts back to the moon. So he announced that a couple of months ago. Um, and um, that's uh, going to be uh, the next big goal. You know, we're doing robotic activity on Mars. There were plans under the previous US administration to send astronauts to Mars, but we've realized since then that going to Mars, which takes about nine months, is a very, very dangerous activity. And uh, with our current understanding of spacecraft and long-term long voyages, any astronauts that went to Mars would basically be half dead by the time they got there, riddled by cancer and God knows what else from uh, all the radiation in space. We don't know. You need so much weight to protect against that that it's not really feasible. So. Human activity on Mars for the moment is something for the distant future. Robotic activity is fine. But if you want to send humans into space, then the moon is the obvious goal. Okay, that, that one can do. Okay. And, um, and so we have um, NASA sending out contracts already to have Amazon-like delivery, you know, to build these projects on the moon. So, um, and Jeff Bezos incidentally has his own rocket company, as you probably know, building commercial launchers. Eventually they will scale up to um, have launchers with more capacity than Saturn V in the future. Eventually, they're not, quite, they're not there yet. Um, but to do deliveries on the moon of many of the components needed. So space, from the US point of view, is a semi-commercial and NASA, a joint exercise, which is interesting too. Um, and so, yeah, so just recently, um, private companies were chosen for future moon landings to, um, 
you know, with um, starting off in an exploratory way, um, there's Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and others, right, involved with running these companies uh, with this great vision of the future. So it's a wonderful thing, actually, that um, um, NASA is looking this far ahead. Okay, well, um, China's got there already. So um, these are all the, um, the, the landings on the moon. Um, there were the few manned landings, the few I showed you, but there are many unmanned um, crashes. Soft, these are the soft impacts on the moon where um, there are many uh, more harder impacts, things self-destructed, but these are, uh, are, are many of the... So all on the near, si near side of the moon, okay, which is technologically easier. So uh, just a couple of weeks ago, China launched um, Chang'e, Chang'e 4, which is the latest in their series of Chang'e, named after the goddess of the moon, I believe, um, to, to explore the moon. And so they had the first soft landing on the far side of the moon. Um, and so um, this, this is their, uh, their, their launch. And um, so what did they do on the moon? Let me, I'll show you that in a second. Um, but th they actually did have a simple radio telescope on that, on that project. So let me just say a few words about why I want to do, we want to do science on the moon. So um, it, it really is the future of cosmology. So this is basically as far back as we go in cosmology. This is the fossil radiation from, from, from the Big Bang on the right there. Um, we haven't found the big mysteries like the dark energy or the dark matter, but we can explore the dark ages. That surely is our, that's a goal right in front of us. We're looking for other more mysterious things, but to go for the dark ages, you have to um, have many, many independent points on the sky, right, to do your study. And if you look at a map like this of the fossil radiation, it has millions of points on the sky, millions of data points, if you like, degrees of freedom or, or pixels on the sky, but that's not good enough to do for the accuracy you need. Likewise, we have future telescopes now which are planning to do vast surveys of galaxies. They took billions of galaxies we, we will be detected in oncoming space surveys in the next few years. Um, again, um, you can improve your precision. You can get now go from a million to a hundred million um, sort of points on the sky, but that's still not enough. So, but it's, it, it's only when you look at the dark ages, we're looking for these clouds because the clouds are so much smaller than galaxies. You have many, many of them. So you have enormous numbers of independent points on the sky, and with enormous numbers, you can use the square root of the number to get incredible precision. That's the way it goes. The more you have, the better the survey. Just like when you're polling you know, for elections or whatever, the more the people that participate in the poll, the more reliable it is. If it's too small a number, you're, also, you're biased in many ways, but if you get a large enough poll, it can work better. It's the same with cosmology. If we have enormous numbers of these clouds for every galaxy, we have trillions of these clouds in print they give us wonderful yardsticks for doing cosmology. So the moon is the place to go. Okay, so here is what the Chinese landed on the moon. Um, this is uh, the lander, and you can see the, th the long wires, 10 meters long. Um, they are the dipoles, um, uh, the antennae, which will do the first experiment to look at the dark age of the sun as well. So unfortunately, they did this experiment in a great hurry because they were eager to, to, to push ahead and the Chinese engineers um, didn't have time to make their satellite um, uh, and the, tra the, the, the transmission on, on this particular lander free of radio, radio noise, radio contamination, which would mess up this low-frequency signal. That's, so you have to design things. So, but you know, they're learning, the scientists are pushing them. And so in, in the next you know, Chang'e 5, which will happen in a couple of years, um, they will, um, I'm sure, greatly refine this and be able to listen into the universe for the, for the, you know, from the far side of the moon, this wonderful environment, this quiet environment for trying to do this. So that's, that's gonna happen. Um, and, um, okay, um, so that's where we are now. They'll, they, I'm sure they're going to be um, other countries joining in to explore the moon in this way. So um, I, I should say that in, 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 in five years' time, the Chinese are planning to send um, one rocket carrying eight small satellites in it, each one of which has a radio telescope, and they'll be launched, they'll be orbiting around the moon, 
around the far side and they'll be stretched out in an array going from hundreds of kilometers above the moon to many thousands or all in a straight line and with that you can basically simulate a huge radio telescope so we're expecting that as a very exciting development and I think we're all waiting to see what other countries will join in and announce similar things but for the moment it's in China's leading the way okay so let's now fast forward and talk about exploration of the moon when humans get there Okay, so there are all sorts of issues. So you need international treaties to, to decide you know, who owns what on the moon. Pollution, what, how do you control pollution? Um, property law, right? Who claims what on the moon? Mineral rights, what do you do about who owns what if you start mining? Is it first come, first served, or is there more to it than that? And criminal law, suppose there are accidents on the moon. So there is, a, there is an outer space treaty. Um, so this tells you about the principles um, governing activities um, on the moon. Um, so here are, I, I just quoted some articles for you. So this is, um, the states shall pursue studies of outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies, and conduct exploration of them so as to avoid their harmful contamination. So that's in this, everyone has signed up to this, all the, all the moon uh, uh, agencies, lunar agencies or space agencies. Another one, all states shall have equally free access to outer space, including the moon and other celestial bodies. Outer space is not subject to expropriation by claim of sovereignty, by means or, of use or occupation. So first come, first serve is not necessarily going to get you a piece of the moon, even though the US put its flags there, which has now turned white mostly. Um, so um, then... Interestingly, um, the military personnel can go to the moon. That's not excluded as long as they keep restricted to peaceful activities. How you ensure that happens, who knows? But, um, and then partner states may exercise criminal jurisdiction over nationals of a partner state whose misconduct in orbit affects the life or safety of a national of another part of the start of the state. So in case of you know, occasional murders on the moon, I think we covered there. Okay. Right, so let me end with this. This is the most amazing picture of Earthrise um, taken by this lunar reconnaissance orbiter. Um, this will be what we want to go to stay, you know, in a hotel on the, on the moon to look for. Yeah. So thank you. <laughs>